uh, for being here. So I'm Dr. Arantxa Laget. So I'm uh, going to present a bit the work we've been doing on the VR part. So basically, how to use this all these nice technologies that that uh, Matia has uh, has been showing, and also getting the insights that also we obtain from from our back history regarding the psychophysics. Uh, so just rapidly, so I'm coming from from REN. So this is this is one of the the, the Inria research centers. Uh, in France, so INRIA is basically the National Institute for Research in Digital Science and Technology. So we have many working on computer science and applied mathematics. So we have centers a bit all over the place, and I think we also have one is closer to here, which is in, uh, in Bordeaux. And also some of the work that I'm going to present also has been uh, conducted thanks to uh, my collaborators that also are involved in the in the project. So. Uh, so myself, Anatole, Mott, uh, Panayotis, Claudio, and, and Sebastian, which is working really hard to make that more ready for the three o'clock. Uh, so really rapidly, so um, the video plays. Okay, maybe okay, just make a click. I try to activate okay. So basically, what, what are we aims or what are our goals uh, in, in this project? So most of you might have already tried a virtual reality, so it's, it's getting a bit a bit commonplace, but Basically, we have seen that a huge advancement in, in visuals, so visual displays, so HLDs, they are getting higher and higher resolution and better, better, better feedback. But what we still lacking is this feeling of touch. So we cannot touch anything, everything is virtual and we can go through through objects without uh, basically being stopped. Uh, and basically, this somehow is one of the following the next frontiers that we are having in, in VR right now. So this is a huge investment on haptic technology right now. And we were really engaged on this on this project because we really felt that, that this electric electric electrodactyl stimulation could be an enabler of such of such interfaces. And basically, here I'm just to somehow illustrate what are the problems that we are facing. So the user is trying to so it's immersed in VR, so he's wearing this HMD and he wants to touch this virtual object. So what happens? So he has his avatar, his virtual hand on VR, but nothing is stopping him from going through this through this surface. Um, and this poses several issues. So first is the this uh, this undermining of of precise interaction because as humans we are strongly driven by our, our tactile sense. So when we touch something or we manipulate some object, we somehow we don't rely on vision to do this interaction. So some of them yes. But some of them not. So what happens if we are? So that we have no choice. We need to rely on vision because if not, if we want to just, for example, avoid uh, this type of, of interpenetrations, unless that we really look at our finger and we stop our emotion at the same time that we see uh, the visual feedback. So uh, this is uh, this somehow something that we don't, don't want. And a lot of studies have shown that this has some strong implications on user experience, especially immersion, this decreased sense of presence. So somehow we see that the experience is somehow not natural. It's basically we know how it kind of uh, decreases the coherence with our, uh, let's say, uh, expectations regarding the interaction. So how this is a, a problem, problematic issue. So basically how has it been done for us to avoid or to at least to compensate for this, this issue? So what we try to typically use is basically only rely on visual feedback and what we do is somehow do this sensory substitution. So we want to somehow uh, compensate the lack of tactile by addition visual feedback or by modulating this visual feedback. So here you have an example in which somehow we decouple uh, the real hand and the visual hand, which you can see here. So this one's still moving while this one stops uh, the, 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 the contact. And somehow uh, we enforce that basically the, the real hand can go through this, this virtual object. However, this generates another issue is that while this hand is on contact, so we're still creating this offset between the real and, the, and this proxy or this, uh, this visual hand. So somehow this impacts our proprioception, can impact on our proprioception because we can see our hand is here, but our real hand is still going down. So, and during this period of time, our feedback is non existent. So we don't have any feedback that allows us to. Uh, to understand or to, to compensate for this offset. So here is where electrotactile feedback could really play a role and try to somehow avoid or to generate this sensory substitution while or uh, while uh, having in this, uh, these situations. So of course there have been other tests that have been uh, trying to use so basically to, to provide like different types of hands to, to provide some additional visual feedback to try to highlight this contact. But somehow this, uh, this provides a lot of, of visual noise uh, to the scene. And in this case, when we have just one finger, it's fine, but the more contacts we start adding, the more 
uh, they hardly catch this, uh, this visual substitution. And of course, there has been a lot of systems, and in the haptic community, there's been a lot of work to try to, to compensate and to render this, this contact, this effort, uh, uh, let's say, uh, rendering. And let's say we have two major families. So once with, we are like, we call like kinesthetic feedback. So basically, this is haptic feedback which aims for muscles and tendons, so to really the force, so this we need to be able to, to generate this force. While we have other types of feedback that normally they are more wearable, that because they are less bulky, so this sometimes relies on exoskeletons or big robotic arms, so this increases a lot uh, the user mobility. So we have other types of feedback which allows, so which are, let's say, more wearable and place more on, um, let's see, this is the connection with the activities, place more on the skin, so to really to render these sensations on the skin, which is somehow the second part of the haptic feedback, which is really this tactile, so really uh, sensations on the on the skin without involving tendons or, or muscles. And basically, this is the scope. What are the challenges in the in this case? So basically, since uh, of, of the previous presentation, somehow they had they, they didn't have to basically to worry about this colocalization between what the user is seeing and what the user is feeling, but we were. In, in VR, we have these two strong constraints. So not all the spatial is aware where the feedback is happening, if it's in the fingertip, in the index, in the middle, or the different phalanxes, but also temporarily. So when I touch something, I want to feel that this touch at the same time. So we don't want any latency. And this and latency is also a strong challenge. And I think it's a really uh, a good feature of the rectopipe. So as Trakita said, there is no screens in the, in the system. So basically everything latency is really, really small. Uh, but it has a really strong challenge that you also have seen uh, during the other presentation. So basically, how we can elicit the tactile sensation that we want to elicit. So how we render roughness using electrotactile feedback, how we render pressure uh, with electrotactile feedback. And of course, this all the authoring that, that comes with this, this problem. And of course, as also Strakina showed, it, we really want to have this, this feedback loop because the user is, is acting, is doing something. Is we are generating some feedback, and of course the user is feeling this feedback through the through the haptic system on this guy, the tactile system. We really want to have this loop with low latency and with a high coherence, so that really uh, the user should be able to to, uh, to really uh, comprehend what he's being uh, doing in, in the system. And and of course there's another challenge, which is we are talking about the hand. So the hand is an extremely complex. Uh, let's say a mechanical system with a lot of joints, a lot of surface, and we've seen on the presentation with a huge uh, tactile, uh, let's say a lot of mechanoreceptors in the skin, so it's somehow hard to chip uh, skin. Uh, just to show some examples, so with visual, with visual feedback like 90 Hz would be good to chip your visual system, but for some uh, tactile uh, sensation uh, you need to go to 1 kHz, so really high, high frequency to, to really elicit the sensation that you want the user to elicit. So it's it's a real, real, real complex. And in this presentation, I wanted to show you, to discuss just two experiments and two work that we've done during the project, which that tries to explore how electrotactile feedback could try to solve uh, these challenges. And of course, we started with the simplest, uh, with the simplest challenge uh, to really have this colocalization and to play with this contact, uh, single contact, uh, uh, let's say, situation. In which what we want is to be able to be able to render this contact between the real hand, or sorry, in this case, the visual hand with some virtual object, uh, and try to use to render some tactile feedback during this recovery. So to really map this, for example, this interpenetration with some tactile feedback to let the user understand whether he's pushing too much or just really barely scratching the surface. And for this, we use the uh, the alpha prototype with the 2.1 uh, electrodes, which Strakini also showed with this uh, regular matrix, and we really used only one part to render the sensation. So we tried to keep it as simple as it could be, but this was really uh, important to explore all this latency colocalization and really the robustness, the robustness of the system. So we, we ran like a smaller user study in which the goal was to try to explore how we could somehow mitigate this lack of feedback during contact using electrotactile feedback, and we explore this with some, let's say, feedback that we know it works, which is with visual feedback. So in this case, so here we, we, we propose some simple uh, contact feedback was this outline that was being rendered uh, on the object that the user was, was touching. And somehow the distance of this outline was 
identifying the, the offset, this interpenetration between these photons. So somehow this provides a, an, let's say, um, unambiguous feedback of the interpenetration. The user knows that when the outline appears that he touches the surface, and of course, the, the bigger it gets the outline, but it's a metaphor, so it's, of course, it's not natural, but it's a way to, to have this baseline to compare uh, with, with visual feedback. So we explore uh, the combination of these uh, two uh, let's say uh, this well, oh, this feedback modality, so electrotactile for one side and visual for the other side. And so now here we see the, the setup of the experiment. So the user was using an HTC Vive uh, with a hand tracker. In this case, we didn't have any any hand tracking, but you can see there is this discoupling between these two. And uh, while in the electrotactile condition, while the user was in contact with the surface, we were rendering, we were activating this one path in which the, somehow we modulated intensity or was close with to try to increase the, bit, the intensity perceived by the user. So the higher the user is pushing, uh, the higher the, the perceived intensity happens. So when just that's the surface with like really mild sensation and the more to push, the stronger the sensation was. So of course, here we were running at 90 Hertz. So we needed like really low latency to be able to, to ensure that, uh, that the system was working and also to integrate all the, uh, all the technology that, that the previous presentations has shown. So here just a brief, uh, a brief uh, really a glimpse on the results. So here you have, so we asked participants to really keep their hand on top of the surface. So really to try to keep his hand on top of the surface for three seconds. And we assess the amount of interpenetration that the participants generate. So basically this plot shows the average interpenetration for all participants, and you have the four conditions we explore. So where there was no feedback, and in this case, we observe that in average, participants generate like 1.2 more or less centimeters of, of offset. So and again, we ask them to be as precise as possible. So then, when we integrate some feedback, either electrotactile or visual, we achieve a significantly uh, decrease on the average interpenetration. But we see people that are really uh, a lot of obtain like interpenetration of really like a, really a several millimeters. And then this was the, the condition in which the, we combined both feedback. So somehow the addition of feedback somehow generated a better result. But what we were interested was really on this comparison between the electrotactile and the visual. And somehow this showed that with electrotactile feedback, we obtained, a, let's say, a, a performance as good as visual feedback. So what this was for us was a really uh, it was really good result because before it was not somehow because latency could have played a role and a lot of uh, side effects could have, uh, let's say, impacted on uh, on this uh, on this result. So somehow, uh, and here for us was really uh, interesting because it was a lot of participants never tried electrotactile feedback before, so it was kind of a learning uh, for us. But we observed that more or less participants achieve this uh, this uh, learning curve, and in general. We got a good acceptability of the system. What we observe, and this might be also interesting for the audience, also related about the comment of, of uh, Matthew about the, so how this acceptability and the learning, basically people get used to this. So what we observe is the first time they tried the system, they calibrated the system, but we were a bit scared. Because first time you say, okay, we have to generate some current with your finger, maybe honestly, people get scared. <laughs> but uh, let's say we did the experiment twice, so we, they did two sessions on the same day, but I mean uh, twice. And so now the second time, for example, what we observed is people were much more comfortable raising the amplitude value, so with a higher, a higher value. And this also uh, had a strong impact on the performance of the user. So, so the better they calibrated the system, the less interpretation they obtained. So we see that this was really important, but somehow after the experiment lasted uh, half an hour, 40, 40 minutes in these two sessions, 20 minutes and 20 minutes. So really in a small amount of time, people somehow get used to this. And what for us was really important is this really low latency. So we were able to achieve this direct contact uh, and basically talk the scene, basically from what you see the visual and the target at the same time. So you see in these movies where there is some, I mean, 30 milliseconds delay between the audio and, this, and the visual, you feel this, so with the target is the same, so there is this latency you really feel uh, uh, this happening. Okay, so what this was really the, the simplest thing we could do. And the next step, uh, was really to, to try to, uh, to explore and, uh, and to exploit more all the options that electrotactile feedback could, could provide. And we explored how we could uh, somehow enrich bare finger interaction. So again, here we were just considering one finger, but the goal was to try to modulate all these parameters that we've seen in the other talks, so contact location, 
uh, uh, with frequency and to see uh, if we could find some mapping that people will uh, basically uh, relate interactions with uh, with some some content. So this was what we wanted to do. So really to try to explore different interactions with, in this case, with one finger, uh, and try to see if we could render electrotactile feedback, which somehow goes in the direction that the user would expect uh, as a tactile sensation. So again, here this is really a, again I wanted to, to highlight this is a really complex uh, complex problem. So of course, as we said, we could modulate and sorry if this is not the perfect diagram, but I just think I'm not an electrotactile expert, but I think it looks like the one we could see before. Uh, but of course, we can modulate a number of parameters, so the amplitude, the pulse width, uh, and, the and the frequency, and other modes. But I mean, we will, uh, we only focus on, on these ones. But of course, we can also play what I think is the, the, the main the main interest of having this high density uh, feedback on the finger is to, we can also play in the pattern activation, the pattern activation. So which uh, let's say which cathodes we uh, we activate on the on the electrode. And here we have some of the examples we tried. So the simple like on off uh, this we were using this matrix uh, electrode. So the simple on off some one uh, but with modulation and then some type of dynamic uh, modulation. So in this case, it's kind of some spread uh, sensations so of some later lateralized sensations so or going to the left or going to the right. And this one more kind of a clockwise pattern. So this basically is some, the, uh, the, the activation is single part, but it's iterating all over the, um, all over the, the electrode. So here we see that we have a lot of combination. And the, the challenge was, okay, how we can map these combinations to Basically, some action that the user is performing with his virtual hand. So we have this basically just to, to highlight like the, the hand model we use. So it's a realistic hand with some simple colliders. So this is a really simple physics-based uh, interaction. But let's say we wanted to explore what basically how we could map uh, somehow the, what the user is doing with the actual stimulation we are going to, we are generating. And again, this is real time. We need to, to extract the state of the, inter of, the uh, of the interaction between the finger and the surface. So there is a lot of, of elements that could play a role. And we have like, let's say a multidimensional mapping. So yeah, we have a set of parameters here. We have a set of parameters here. And we need to define this mapping between these, these two states. To get uh, too much into detail, but uh, what we propose is to have some, some somehow decoupling between what's going on on the VR side and what uh, with the actual electrotactile stimulation, and we have some some information about the kinematics of the hand, the object the user is touching, and the contacts, so the dynamics between the hand and the, and the objects. And with this, we obtain some modulation based on some specific interaction parameters, like interpenetration, as we see on the first example, or some material parameters. For example, we can consider the roughness of the surface, for example, and we generate a number of mappings, which allows us to identify some uh, patterns or some uh, some configurations of the electrotactile feedback. And this was kind of exploratory assessment. So we tried to, to come up with uh, with some of the mapping which makes sense. And there was a lot of pilot testing to try to go some, to some <coughs> test which actually makes sense. And the video, of course, won't play. Okay. So here you see the user uh, performing some actions. We were using these electrons. And this, we have some examples of the, the visual feedback to see basically to see which are the, uh, the, the, the feedback generated. So here we see one, uh, for example, the user is pushing a button and basically we are generating this spread sensation. So to generate this effort. And in this one, it's the same feedback, but this uh, sensation is generated much faster. So try to simulate that this was a stiffer, uh, a stiffer object. I would like to see if I can play it again. Yeah. So in this case, what is on off? So the, the part is enabled or disabled. In this one, the part is <coughs> enabled and disabled. There is some modulation. Okay, you can see some grading change. It's really subtle, maybe for the for the end rope. But this one is is much clearer. So we have this um, this spread uh, going on. So this is uh, several examples that I hope that you will be able to test in the sessions later on. Um, and this is another example in which we are exploring the sliding. So the user is doing some sliding motion around the surface, and the goal is to try to generate some motion uh, through the through the pads. So again, you see it's it's inverted, so the direction you don't need to, you want to uh, there is no match in the direction, it's just because the video is inverted. So the, the idea is that use uh, 
the different parts that we have on the, on the fingers. So if the user is sliding towards the left, we will move the motion, sensation of the motion towards the left, and the user is moving to the right, we will move the sensation towards the right, and somehow, so I played it again, so this is what you get. Of course, again, this is, it's inverted, this zero. But we get this uh, real-time coupling between uh, the, the interaction state and also the, the mapping. So and here I just for you to have some some basically all the complexity which lies behind. Uh, so this is an example of a simple uh, basically a full suite modulation based on user penetration. So we have the two sides. So in one side we have the interaction state, which is this user penetration, and on the other side we have the purely uh, electrotactile properties, which is full suite. And the goal is how to, for example, uh, map some stiffness with some uh, finger interpenetration range. For example, one centimeter of max finger interpenetration to achieve the strongest intensity, or like a high one. So normalized protocol properties because we try to create some abstraction between this part and the electrotactile properties to have some interaction. And then finally, once the, this strength parameter is computed, we can just map it to a, a tactile parameter, electrotactile property, which is positive. So when the strength is lowest, for example, like a really small pulse width, and, then, and when the strength is higher, higher, higher pulse width. And with this, we are able to provide some complex offerings. And this is all is parameterized, so we can parameterize all these parameters. And here you have just a brief example. So we have this interface in Unity, which allows to define all these mappings in real time in, in, in an offering process. So we can define the mappings, uh, the, uh, the different uh, relationships between material property, uh, parameters, interaction parameters. So this is all can be authored uh, directly in Unity and tested. And this again is linked uh, with the with electrotactile, uh, electrotactile stimulation. And here we are having some, some example in which we are mapping, for example, roughness and the motion of the stick or the finger to have this uh, dynamic mapping between how fast the user is moving and basically which is the frequency, for example, that we are generating on the fingertip with some also some pressure based on stiffness and interpenetration. So also to, to add that in addition the, the, the effort that the user is generating. And finally, some direction mapping, but this left and right. So we could basically define uh, all of this. And after that, the goal was try. OK, so now we have some 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 guesses, so how we could map uh, this interaction state uh, with the uh, with the electrodactyl parameters. So we made an, expo an exploratory evaluation in which the user had, we, we provide the user with three tasks. So uh, let's say compressing a spring, tapping over an object, and also doing some lateral exploration. So we have these three tasks. And we, let's say, conceived a set of potential uh, tactile effects. And let's say all the parameters that are linked with these effects are somehow mapped to the properties of the task that is doing. And the goal is there is a map. So there are people, so basically all, let's say, participants will agree to which of these effects works better with one of these tasks. So it is some, basically some coherent or some perfect choice that everyone uh, will, um, let's say, will have. Uh, and here, what we did is just uh, we asked them to grade the coherency between what they were doing and what they were feeling, and also to rank all uh, all the tactile effects for each of the tasks. So how to provide okay for this task, uh, which is your best, which is the thing which works best, the second and so on. So and, and the results are here is still preliminary, so we're still finishing the, the analysis. So the results are quite are quite in general interesting. Uh, so in general, uh, participants they they like or they they really uh, linked this intensity or this uh, let's say uh, uh, this intensity modulation with tapping and pressing interaction. So so that's what we were somehow expecting. Although we get some some of the results which are a bit less less intuitive. Uh, and the second one is regarding the sliding interaction. So really people uh, really liked all the effects that generate some motion under the finger. So the idea is that they, they somehow they integrate well to having some hand so their finger mo moving, but also receiving some moving feedback under their skin. So this is interesting. But for example, some uh, some just to show, but also the interaction. This is the interaction uh, task. These are the different effects. So for example, the, the effect which was ranked in general better. So uh, red is, is better in this in this in this graph. So is the direction. So to have this left and right motion over the bats. 
But for example, the random, this is a ra purely random activation. So there, there was some random activation and the clockwise activation that they're doing this spinning uh, pattern was somehow also uh, liked for some of the participants. So again, here uh, it's kind of the, uh, also what uh, I said that sometimes we can compensate some lacks of the tactile feedback by the actual uh, uh, visual feedback. So random sometimes could elicit some motion because you could, although it's some random activation of the pads, it might generate some sensation of motion, which if it's good when coupled with the actual motion of the user, it could be well perceived. Similar for the clockwise. So if the user somehow it, uh, synchronizes the motion of the clockwise pattern with exploration motion, it can have like a good chance that it's doing really this. So it's generating some actual synchronized sensation left to right with the clockwise pattern. So this is a bit our hypothesis, but again, there is still much more work to do uh, because there is way too many, too many potential combinations between all these, uh, <coughs> all these parameters. So in general, what we observe is that yes, there are some slight different preferences among participants, but they could be also for some uh, confounding factors based that some of the effects uh, might be uh, not well uh, integrated or I mean, they are somehow the, the user compensates uh, with the visual with the visual feedback, but in general, we obtain that this directional effect really obtain uh, a really kind of unanimous, um, unanimous, uh, let's say, uh, uh, was unanimous among all the all the participants. And again, of course, there is still a lot of, of things to do, and this is my, my my final my final slide. So of course, there is some of the parameters we didn't exploit. So we didn't exploit the frequency, for example, and we could. Uh, of course, uh, explore all the types of pattern activation and again with the, the new version of the electrodes with a different uh, distribution of the paths you could also generate uh, different uh, uh, different uh, effects. Another aspect of the story is the material properties. So in the examples or all the examples we tested, we consider that all the objects were homogeneous. So there was no variety vari 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 of roughness, for example. And this, we believe that it could be uh, similar with the result that Strachidia showed, it could really be Motivated by frequency and by chance, we did the use frequency. So it's a good, a good uh, following step. Uh, and again, we could also still, in this case, we still single finger, so there are all much other tasks that can be explored, such as grasping, for example, which is still, still a future, future work. Okay, so this uh, was all for me. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any, any questions, please. Thank you, Feira. Yes, we can take uh, one, two questions uh, while I'm setting up the next presentation. The next presentation will be the other way around. So we try to get something through the internet to here. So are there any questions? So maybe from my side, I mean, uh, the big advantage that you had <laughs> compared to when Strahinia was test testing is that you had this uh, visual component. Um, but of course, it also gives you a, a bit of, of complication. Um, where do you see the, the good mix between what you get visually, what you get uh, in terms of, of vibrotactile? Um, I mean, now when we are talking about the VR scenes, it can be at night going around, so tactile can be uh, useful or, or so. Or, or so I, I think so. I think one of the main advantages of using uh, this additional modality is that you can overload uh, the visual modality, which is already somehow really overload uh, in a VR in a VR setup. Plus, sometimes you are interacting with things that you are not seeing. From where you are not seeing, of course, you cannot compensate with visual feedback because I mean there is nothing you can do. So this is where really uh, tactile feedback could be uh, really, uh, really, really interesting. But again, it's it's from one side we can it's, it's, uh, at the end is this dominance between these different cues. So which is more dominant? Is vision more dominant? Which normally is the case that when tactile is not, uh, let's say, uh, as as good as it would be in reality because you compensate, but still it's not clear what is the dominance. So this is something that we didn't explore, but this is kind of classical uh, psychophysical experiments in which you make these two cues in contradiction and you try to see which of the cues dominate. So which one is pretty, pretty dominant 
uh, with respect to the other. My first guess is that visual would be uh, more dominant in this case, but I mean, still uh, something. And this is what we see also with somehow with our results, and sometimes even having some effects that were not really the good ones, people kind of like it. So somehow we see there is kind of slight dominance of vision, but still I think in, there is a lot of cases which uh, vision is not enough. So mm -hmm. it's really, really, uh, it's really, really important. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's quite clear of the representation in the cortex yeah. that the vision takes a lot of space. Yeah. On the other hand, for blinds or for yeah. those that have vision disabilities, yeah. it could be yeah. the opposite. I don't know if I guess you have maybe I don't know, some experience with blind people if they are much more, I mean, if they have better discrimination. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, from, from the Braille. <laughs> capability and so on, it's, it, it is clear. Okay, thanks uh, again. So let me check with you, Maurizio. You can hear me? And yes, I'm here and I can hear you. Good morning.